I just got so excited because that was so beautiful. So there's a movie called uh, Walking Across Egypt that is about a widow named Maddie Rigsby, played by Ellen Burstyn, who was moved by her pastor's message to care for the least of these. And so she reaches out to a 16-year-old boy named Wesley Benfield, who was played by Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Does anybody remember Jonathan Taylor Thomas, right? He was in um, Home Improvement, right? JTT, we called him when I was young. Anyway, uh, Wesley Benfield was a character, and his parents had abandoned him as a baby, and he's serving time in a correctional center for stealing a car. So after Maddie visits Wesley at the correctional center on a couple of different occasions, he breaks out and goes to her house. And so thinking that he is on leave, that he was legally allowed out of the correctional center, he, uh, she allows him to stay with her for a short period of time. Now, ultimately, he's apprehended and he gets sent back to the center, but Maddie's compassion continues to grow for the orphan. And even though Maddie's adult children, who are named Robert and Elaine, are a little bit disgruntled with her involvement with Wesley, they try to dissuade Maddie from caring for Wesley. And so they have this conversation. Elaine, the daughter, says to her, he's an escaped convict. You could be charged with aiding and abetting a criminal. Maddie snaps back, he's not a criminal, Elaine. Robert disagrees, he's a thief, mama, he's a juvenile delinquent. And Maddie says to him, Robert, nobody ever loved him. Robert replies, if they did, he probably stole their car. When Maddie begins to say, the Bible says, Elaine interjects and says, Mom, we know what the Bible says. The Bible is full of wonderful stories. It's a monument to humanity, but that's all that it is. It's just a storybook. The good Lord says, we must help the least of these, our brothers and sisters, Maddie declares. And that boy is one of the least of these. You have already done plenty for him. You've done more than the most would. Doesn't the Bible say when to stop, Elaine asks? And Maddie emphatically replies, no. It's a story of going above and beyond, of God's loving kindness and redemption being carried out, lived out by ordinary people like Maddie. We've been reading together for the past three weeks another story along those same lines, a story of God's loving kindness portrayed through the actions of simple and ordinary people, two women and a man who went above and beyond for one another. Two weeks ago, we began reading the book of Ruth. Now, if you've memorized the books of the Bible, you'll know that Ruth comes after Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges. And I only know that because I sang the song to myself that I learned to memorize them when I was writing it. You have to say it really fast, otherwise I leave one out. It's a story written, as I told you two weeks ago, in a time period between the time of the judges, when scripture tells us everyone did what was good in their own eyes, meaning that they didn't follow God's law and they weren't always held accountable for it or to it, and the time of the kings, when King Samuel and David and Solomon ruled over Israel, the United Kingdom. So far in our story, we've met Ruth and Naomi, who after losing her, two hus her husband and her two sons, decides to return home to Bethlehem. Her daughter-in-law, Ruth, decides to follow her, and despite Naomi's objections that she'd have better prospects elsewhere, goes with her back to Bethlehem. And then last week, Boaz entered our story. Ruth goes to glean in Boaz's field, which means she goes to pick up um, the uh, wheat and barley that they left behind as their... Um, um, harvesting it, and he uh, goes above and beyond by offering her protection because he's heard about the kind and loving things that she's done for Naomi. As I told you last week, the story of Ruth is a love story. It's a love story uh, between Ruth and Naomi, that, and this week we discover that it's a love story between Boaz and Ruth, and of course, it's also a love story about God and God's people, but it's also a theological story. One about how God proves loving and faithful through the simplest of everyday earthen vessels. So let's go over where the story brings us this week, what Alexa read for us a few minutes ago. Naomi and Ruth have been living in Bethlehem, which literally means the house of bread, and have been eking out an ex existence through Ruth's work gleaning in the field of Boaz. Boaz. 
And now, just like in the movie The Fiddler on the Roof, Naomi, the mother-in-law uh, for Ruth, plays the role of matchmaker and begins to plan out the marriage for Ruth. She justifies her actions to her by saying, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. In reality, she's also concerned about her own security as a widow, which she should be, living in a man's world. In the patriarchal society of biblical times, women were very dependent upon men for their survival. And so Naomi, fearing her future and the future of Ruth, who had made this huge sacrifice in coming back to Bethlehem with her, comes up with a plan to marry Ruth off. Naomi's plan for Ruth is to visit Boaz at night on the threshing floor after he's finished eating and drinking and sends Ruth out smelling of perfume and dressed to the nines, was at the very best an ambiguous plan and at worst, by today's standards, one that was a little sexually risky. So let's stop for just a minute and talk about the law. Because I think in some ways, the law is a fourth character in our story. Sometimes the laws in the Old Testament get a bad rap. We think of them as legalistic and some of them as a little bit crazy, but I think we always have to keep in mind the intentions behind the laws. God gave the people the law as a gift, starting with the Ten Commandments and then moving on into the laws found in Deuteronomy and Leviticus so that the people would know what it looks like to love God and God's people. God knew that the people around them didn't always love and take care of one another. And God knew that our tendency as human beings is to look out for ourselves first and those around us second. So God gave the law to the Israelites so that we could know whether or not we were truly loving God and God's creation. He says to us, if you're loving God, you're going to put God first in your life. If you're loving God's creation, you're not going to steal from one another or murder each other. If you're loving God, you're going to take care of the orphan and the widow and the stranger. So think of it not so much as a list of rules that you had to live up to, but more like a painting. God is painting for them a picture of what it looks like when we are living in harmony with God and with one another. So God uses the laws to take care of God's people and to help us take care of one another. And we see that occur over and over again in the story of Ruth. In ancient Israel, the harvest of the barley and wheat in the fall was a very big deal. If conditions were just right, which means if the rain fell just the right way and the temperature stayed just the right place and the soil produced and the harvest came in time, then the people would have enough food to survive the winter and to live well into the coming year. They couldn't just run to giant when they ran out of carrots, right? Agricultural historians, however, estimated that this happened, just the right things falling into place, only about 70% of the time. Three out of 10 years, there was not enough rain to produce a good harvest. And about every 10 years, the lack of rain would produce drought conditions. And after two or more years of drought in a row, famine occurred, which we see occur over and over again in scripture. So that is the conditions where our story begins, right? That's where Ruth and Naomi begin. There has been a famine in the land. But that's not where we find ourselves in this chapter. In this year, the soil has produced big time. And this big harvest was seen and felt as a sign of God's loving faithfulness to them. If you remember, the reason that um, Ruth and Naomi decide to go back to Bethlehem from Moab was because Naomi had heard a rumor that God was providing for the people again in Bethlehem. That's what takes them back. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 13 through 15, God gives this command to the Israelites. Rejoice during your festival, you sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, as well as the Levites, the strangers, the orphans, and the widow resident in your town. For seven days you shall surely celebrate. This was the celebration they were to have after the harvest came in. And it wasn't just to be a sedate get-together of sitting and praying and giving thanks to God for the harvest. This was a party. God commands them, he says in Deuteronomy 14, whatever you wish, oxen or sheep or wine or beer or whatever you desire, you shall consume for seven days. 
This party, called the Festival of the Booze, celebrated the yearly barley harvest, and it lasted a whole week long. We saw already last week that one of the ways that God's hesed, God's loving kindness, is reaching out in faithful love is through the law, right? God had given the Israel's laws, like when you reap the harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. That's what, um, Naomi, uh, that's what Ruth does when she's gleaning in Boaz's field. He says to them, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. In the book of Ruth, Boaz and other of the um, people from Bethlehem are found obeying the law, allowing Ruth and others of the poor to glean in safety. Boaz actually tells his maidservants to, um, to drop extra things on the field for Ruth to pick up. Through the law and through their obedience to the law, God's loving faithfulness was reaching out to Ruth and through Ruth to Naomi. And now we see God's faithfulness to God's people even through this celebration. It's as if God knew that we needed celebrations like this. Like God knows that life is hard, that harvesting is hard, and the people needed time to celebrate when times were good. And they needed to be able to do it in such a way that they were commanded to stop their work and celebrate. We see in our scripture this morning that Boaz certainly participates fully in the festival. It describes him this way. He was eating and drinking until he was in a contented mood. He was enjoying the festival. The second law God uses in this story to take care of Ruth and Naomi is called the law of Leviterate marriage. According to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10, it was a brother's duty to marry his deceased brother's wife. He and his deceased brother's widow were to give birth to a firstborn son. This son would be named after the deceased husband in order to perpetuate his name and family line. And the son would also receive the deceased husband's inheritance. So in terms of property law, according to Leviticus 25, it says, If anyone of your kin falls into difficulty and sells a piece of property, then the next of kin shall come and redeem what the relative has sold. So these laws of Leviterate marriage were determined by the men of Israelite society, although the women were beneficiaries of the law, but only if they had some kind of family connection with the male relatives and they would follow the law to help them. Women without any male family members to ensure their security were destined to live in poverty. Women without any children were also destined to live without honor in the community because childbearing was regarded as a blessing. And if you weren't able to bear children, it was thought that you were cursed. And that seems to be the situation of Ruth and Naomi at the beginning of our story. Their future security was virtually non-existent because there was no male relative to marry Ruth and to further the family line. There was no public social safety net for them. They had to rely on somebody following the law, on doing their duty in this poor nation. So we come to Boaz, who goes above and beyond the requirements of Leviterate marriage law when he agrees to marry Ruth, because he was not a brother of Naomi's or of Ruth's deceased husband, so there was really no legal obligation. His loyalty and loving kindness and mercy are shown because he agrees to marry Ruth, who's not even a Jew. She's a Gentile, which in some eyes was a very risky thing because some of the Israelites believed that God did not look kindly upon or bless Israelites who married Gentiles. So let's go back to our story for a minute. Naomi tells Ruth to shower up, tells her to pick out her most beautiful dress, to do her hair up just right, to put on her most alluring perfume, and to go to Boaz. And now I quote to you from the NRSV. She tells him, her to uncover his feet and lie down. Uncover his feet. Some scholars think that this is a euthanism for something a little more scandalous than feet that she was uncovering. 
So Ruth did just as Naomi instructed. Boaz and Ruth are together on the threshing room floor, and then Ruth does something that makes her a little bit my hero. She proposes marriage to Boaz. She says to him, spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. And since that's pretty much what I said to Dwight, which is, we're going to get married, you let me know when you're ready, she's, um, she's a little bit my hero. So this reference to a man spreading his cloak over a woman is a reference to the marriage ceremony, symbolically bringing her both into his bed and under the protection of his wings. And it's a reference to the Leviterate marriage law. He is next of kin, like a little far out next of kin, and so is in a way responsible for her and also gets first dibs on her as a relative. And Boaz says to her, yes. There on the threshing floor under the cover of darkness and of his cloak, they exchanged the equivalent of marriage promises. And as they did so, God was at work. You see, although God never speaks a word the entire way through the book of Ruth, through the actions of Boaz, God was at work rescuing Ruth from a marginal life of gleaning forever as a foreigner in a strange land. But I also like to think that God was also at work rescuing Boaz through Ruth, who was apparently alone, and love moved into his home. And through Ruth, God was at work rescuing Naomi. Naomi had sent Ruth with instructions as to how Ruth could secure her own future, but Ruth accomplishes not only that, she also secures a future for Naomi. When Boaz said to Ruth that this last instance of your loyalty is better than the first, he was referring to Ruth's loyalty to himself. She had picked him, even though more appealing and younger men were available. But also, and I think especially, he is referring to her loyalty to Naomi. By choosing the older, less attractive, but more loyal Boaz, that night Ruth was also securing a future for Naomi. And we're going to hear a little bit more about how that happens next week when we read chapter 4. All of this God accomplishes through the earthly, earthen vessels named Ruth and Boaz and the promises that they exchanged. And then, early in the morning, while it is still dark, the um, version that Alexa read says, before uh, anybody could recognize one another, before it's still light, they get up and leave. Ruth steals away to go home. And that's where our story ends for today. Boaz tells Ruth, promises really, that he will act, but there are not yet any guarantees that he will follow through. Naomi ends the chapter by saying, we will see tomorrow what he actually does. So we end with the promises exchanged, but not yet fulfilled. In the morning when she leaves Boaz and returns to Naomi, Ruth must have wondered, would the promises that they exchanged together at the dark of midnight stand up to the brightness of the day? In the morning, would Boaz actually keep his promise? In the morning, would the legal processes of the village function as God intended them to? In the morning, would God still prove faithful? Leaving off with promises exchanged but not yet fulfilled, I think seems appropriate for today because the life of faith is like that. We, the spiritual descendants of Ruth, walk by faith in the wake of promises made but not yet kept. We have received the promise in our baptism. We are strengthened by the sustaining promise when we worship and, and um, share in the Lord's Supper together. We celebrate the promise that Christ is risen. And as Advent approaches for us, we remember the promise that Christ will come again into our broken world. But the promises are not yet fully kept. And so we cling tightly to the promise. And with the psalmist, we confess that weeping may linger for the night, but joy will come with the morning. Those are promises we can and must cling to. In weeks like this one, when our world has once again been terrorized in the light of day by unspeakable acts of violence, we cling to those promises. On days when our own lives seem unstable, when we feel like we are teetering on the edge of safety and security, we cling to those promises. In moments when we are not sure how God will provide for us or how we will provide for ourselves, we cling to those promises. But here's the thing. We don't have to cling to or even remember those promises alone. 
That's why we gather together in worship, so that we can remind one another Christ has come, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We gather together to speak words of hope and life and love into one another's lives. We gather together to remember God's promises, to pray for one another, and to act as Ruth and Naomi and Boaz did for the good of those around us. Each of them had to make decisions, minute by minute, to follow the law laid before them, to live as God intended, in a way that each person was cared for beyond measure and without thought for themselves. Ruth gives up her life for Naomi. Naomi makes a plan to ensure a bright future for Ruth, and Boaz acts to feed and provide security for both of them. Each of them go above and beyond their required duty under the law in their own way to act out of loyalty, loving kindness, and mercy. And God calls us to do the same. So this week, as we continue to respond to the events in our world, in our lives, in our homes, I invite you to consider how might God use you? an ordinary person working in simple and concrete ways? How might you go above and beyond what's required of you, knowing that God doesn't tell us when to stop choosing love? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.